Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with David Kessler. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. I'm thrilled to remind everyone that all nine of our stores are currently open for both inside service and curbside pickup. We also have a new store in Napa and it's beautiful. So check it out when you have a chance to travel there and maybe not in fires. Um, as many of you know and can attest to, COVID-19 has been extremely tough on small businesses, in particular uh, independent bookstores like us. So as such, I just wanna take a moment and thank all of you for your continued support. Um, you know, we, we couldn't do these free events without the support of people like you. So for that, we are very grateful. Um, I also have a very special event related announcement. It's coming soon for everyone, but I wanna let you all in. So tune in at the end and I'll give you some details. So just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce tonight's author. We will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links to purchase David's latest title, as well as a 10% discount code for use on our website, links to purchase previous works by tonight's author, and we'll also include my contact details for post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any questions or comments for the speaker. The format will feature between 30 to 45 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. Uh, please go ahead and submit your, your questions and comments here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. I really appreciate that. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's author, David Kessler. David is the world's foremost expert on grief. His experience with thousands of people on the edge of life and death has taught him the secrets to living a fulfilled life even after life's tragedies. He co-authored On Grief and Grieving and Life Lessons with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and You Can Heal Your Heart, Finding Peace After a Breakup, Divorce, or Death with Louise Hay. He is also the author of The Needs of the Dying, which received praise from Mother Teresa. David's work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Business Week, and Life Magazine, as well as on CNN, Fox, NBC, PBS, and CBS. David has served on the Red Cross Aviation Disaster Team and has volunteered for decades as a Los Angeles Police Department Specialist Reserve Officer. He lectures for physicians, nurses, counselors, police, and first responders, and also leads talks and retreats for those dealing with grief. David is with us tonight to discuss his latest title, Finding Meaning, the sixth stage of grief. You know, I'm really thrilled to have you here with us this evening to discuss this sensitive topic. And unfortunately, everyone experiences grief at some point in their life. And as many of you and, and I know, it's this loss can leave us, you know, unsure of what to do or how to feel. And drawing from his experiences, this book articulates an essential component for living with grief, and that is the ability to construct meaning out of tragedy. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, David. Um, you know, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Jamie, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate the introduction. You um, forgot to tell people that I was president of my ninth grade class two years in a row, so I was very proud of that. <laughs> It took my sons a long time to get the joke in front of one of them finally said, you're not saying you failed a grade, are you? And I'm like, yes, I failed a grade. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for all who are watching this. It is a challenging subject, but we deal with this more than we know. There's so many types of losses that we deal with. We're going to talk about them now in COVID, the big, the little ones. When we think of grief, we often think of a death, but that's not the only kind of loss that happens. So for any of you that may be here for grief other than death, let me just start by telling you how I think of it. So as you hear this, you can maybe apply something to your own life. I actually see everything as a death, meaning a breakup is the death of a relationship. A divorce is the death of a marriage. 
a job loss is the death of that job with those people and that paycheck in that situation. We're in a pandemic. The world that we know, there's the death of the old world that has happened. That it's not coming back. That innocent world where we could handshake and do all that is probably changed forever. Just the, the world we knew earlier this year. And so we all find ourselves in a new world. So maybe let me go back and do some history, then I'll come to where we are and uh, talk a little further. So I was, um, I often say this isn't a career that uh, you choose, it often chooses you. I was 13 years old. I had grown up with a mother who was ill most of my life. She was in and out of hospitals. I thought that's what your parents did. When I was 13, she got really sick and had to go to the big hospital in the nearest big city. And uh, while we were there, she was in an ICU that I couldn't go and visit because I was 13 and you had to be 14. I never thought to lie about my age. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in the hospital lobby. And at the hotel across the street, one day we were over there, my father and I, and someone started yelling fire. And we all ran out and sure enough, there was huge flames coming out of the 18th floor. And then within a few minutes, the fire trucks were there, they were extending the ladder and shooting began. It turned out to be, first of all, it went on for 13 hours. It turned out to be one of the first mass shootings in the US. So at a young age, I experienced my mother's death without me being there, as well as seeing, you know, people die. And that kind of thing changes you as we learn all loss changes us in some way. And I was curious about how to deal with what I had learned. And there wasn't a me there or someone, you know, we didn't sort of have grief specialists the way we do today. So there wasn't anyone there to help me. And in an ironic way, I think I've kind of turned out to be someone that maybe could have helped me. Um, had a, uh, uh, I got to community college. Someone said to me, there's two really easy classes. Like anything that wasn't trigonometry, it was easy. And uh, they said it was human sexuality and uh, the class on death and the human sexuality is full. And I went, okay, I'll do the class on death. And I learned about this woman, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who had identified these five stages of dying. And she'd written this amazing groundbreaking book called On Death and Dying. Little did I know someday I would uh, get to know her. So I stepped in and out of a career helping people many times. I wasn't sure if this is what I wanted to do, but no matter what I chose, it kept coming back to this. And so I became a death and grief expert. And, you know, in our modern world now, we have sort of hospice and palliative care over here, and we have grief counseling here. And it was important to Kubler-Ross and important to me to sort of know both because obviously they're connected together. So I chose fully this field at a certain point and was working in it. And then I uh, um, was going to be speaking at a conference, an international conference in Egypt where Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was the uh, keynote, and that's when she had her stroke and wasn't able to make it. And after that, I was able to have a phone conversation with her. And, you know, the way you might with someone like her, I, I had a conversation with her. I got connected because of the uh, person who was uh, doing the talks, handling the organization of it. And she was so gracious and asked how it was, and I asked how she was recovering from her stroke. And uh, then at the end of this beautiful conversation, I said to her, well, I hope somehow, some way our paths, our paths cross and we really get to meet each other. And I left it sort of there like willy nilly, I hope we get to meet each other. And Elizabeth said, how about Tuesday? And I realized this was a woman who made things happen in the world. 
So obviously I saw her Tuesday. Um, we became good friends. We went on to write two books together, Life Lessons, and on grief and grieving. And on grief and grieving, Elizabeth asked me to help adapt with her, her famous stages for dying to stages of grief. And in the book on grief and grieving, literally on page one, on page one, we say, the stages are not a map for grief. They're not linear. There's no right way to do grief. It's completely organic. Every um, issue that people have with the stages was literally addressed on page one. You, you hear those issues from people and I'm like, have you happened to read page one? Because I said, we addressed your issues at the beginning of the book. So it was such an honor to work with her and she was such a trailblazer and really the modern um, uh, founder of our hospice movement in the US. So the stages of grief, which many of you have heard of are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You can do them all in an hour. They don't go in any order. There's just a million ways they happen. So I've had this career working with people and a few years ago, out of the blue, my younger son, David, died. And it was just and still is so brutal. I was a father who had to bury his son. And I wanted to write a note to everyone that I had counsel, especially every parent, saying I didn't realize how bad it was. And at a certain point, I also was a grief expert who would go, yep, you're in anger. Oh, yep, you're in denial. I can't believe he's gone. Oh, I'm angry. It's all happening in the same hour. And as I experienced grief as a dad and as a grief expert, at a certain point, I had to wrestle, as we all do, with acceptance. And I just felt it can't end in acceptance. That can't be it. And one of the things that's happened over the years is that acceptance took on a finality that Elizabeth and I never attend, intended it to have. There is no ending of grief. Whenever someone says to me, how long am I going to grieve? My response is always, how long is a person going to be dead? Because if they're going to be dead for a long time, you're going to grieve for a long time. But it doesn't always mean you will grieve with pain. The goal is to hopefully help people grieve with more love than pain in their own way, at their own pace, in their own time. So as I wrestled with acceptance, it wasn't enough. I wanted more. And I think we're a generation that wants more. So I had read Viktor Frankl's work. I was so curious about this idea of meaning, always had been. And I began talking to other parents who had found meaning. Then I began talking to people whose spouses had died, whose parents had died, about how they were able to find meaning. And it began something that was my healing. And uh, it turned into this book, which is Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief, The Reason Why I'm Here Tonight. And I was so honored that the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation and family gave me permission to add a stage to her iconic stages. So I want to just share a few things about this concept of meaning. The first thing is it's not a quick bypass to the pain. It's not, you know, a spiritual bypass or anything. You actually can't bypass the pain. Most of the book is actually helping you deal with the pain so that you can find meaning. It's a little like uh, Michelangelo would talk about he needed to excavate the excess around the great statue so you could see what's inside. Meaning's what's inside. We have to excavate a lot of the pain. So meaning doesn't take away the pain. It is a cushion. 
The second thing I want you to know about meaning is that some people hear meaning and they go, there's no meaning in someone's death. There's no meaning in an Alzheimer's or a pandemic. There's no meaning in that. And I'll go, correct. There is no meaning in the death. Meaning is in us. Meaning is what we do after the loss. So meaning can occur in a number of different ways. In fact, a million ways, but meaning can be you want to find a way to honor the person. Maybe meaning can be you want to make sure no one else dies the way they did. You're changing a law, you're bringing awareness. Of course, meaning can be, you know, the person who starts the foundation or the charity, but meaning usually occurs in small, meaningful moments. You don't have to start a charity to find meaning. In fact, partly what we need to learn to do is name our meaningful moments. My hope is that this is a meaningful moment for anyone watching it. I hope that somehow this has as much meaning for you as it does for me. So meaning can occur in so many ways. Meaning can be you realize the brevity of life, that this life is not guaranteed and you want to make a change to do something with this one wild life you've been given. So lots of ways meaning can occur. I write in the book about, uh, well, let me just read it to you if I may. Since this is a, you know, a reading for a bookstore, I should probably read a book, right? Uh, here are some thoughts that may guide you in understanding meaning. Number one, meaning is relative and personal. Number two, meaning takes time. You may not find it until months or even years after loss. Number three, meaning does not require understanding. It's not necessary to understand why someone died in order to find meaning. In fact, many times I tell people, it's important to ask why. Certainly early in grief, you wanna put a detective hat on and ask why did this happen? But in all my years of work, I've never had anyone say to me, wow, we got an answer, it was so satisfying. Even if you sit down with the doctors or pull the autopsy report and find answers, they're not satisfying answers as to why. Four, even when you do find meaning, you won't feel it was worth the cost. So for instance, I think about the woman who started MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Her daughter was killed by a drunk driver. She doesn't know why, even still. And she's gone on to save thousands and thousands of lives, maybe millions, but she still doesn't understand it why her daughter had to die. And five, this is a really big one these days. Your loss is not a test, a lesson or something to handle, a gift or a blessing. Loss is what happens in life. Meaning is what you make happen. And six, only you can find your meaning. And seven, meaningful connections will heal painful memories. So that's from Finding Meaning. And I think it's so important that we think of how meaning occurs. We want our lives to be meaningful. One of the ways for me, this book, my son, David, my younger son, he, uh, in kindergarten these days, every child gets an award. He got an award for the most likely child to become a helper. David didn't get to become a helper in his life. I hope with this book, he gets to help so many people. And I'm just so honored to see how many lives it's touching and how it's finding its way in the world. Um, I just heard uh, that uh, Simon & Schuster Audio has uh, submitted it for a, uh, a Grammy for the audio. And, you know, look, when you hear best-selling and possible Grammy nomination, 
to me, that's all about something's resonating with people that we want to make meaning of their lives. We want to honor them. We don't want them to be forgotten. We want to know that their death mattered and their life mattered. And so that's why I think meaning is so important as we go down this road to help us in our journey of healing. When I use that word healing, I always want to remind people Healing does not mean forgetting. We get worried that somehow, if someday we're healing, we might be disloyal. And I don't believe that. I believe that we honor our loved ones. You know, people always say, you don't understand when my loved one died, a part of me died with him. And I say, I do understand that. But a part of them also lives on in you. How can you nurture that part of them that lives on in you? So that's the premise of finding meaning. And sometimes meaning, and I really go through lots of tools about how you can deal with the pain and the guilt and the what ifs and the if only, because death often leaves us feeling guilty, wishing we had done it differently. It helps us normalize this experience of guilt. We live in a grief illiterate world. We live in a world where people um, tell those in grief to move on or get over it. Your loved one is not a cold that you recover from or get over. So people don't understand this concept until it comes to them. Now we're in the middle of COVID. So I want to just talk about that in relationship to all that's going on. First, in COVID, we get to see how many kinds of losses there are. There's obviously the people who have had a loss that their loved one has died. There's also the people who have had to cancel a wedding. There's people who are not having a graduation. There's people who go into college for the first time is in front of a computer at home. There's people who have canceled trips. There's work projects that have canceled. There's jobs that have ended. That's our world. Our kids can't just have a play date like they normally would. So that's what we're all living in. I talk about it as macro and micro losses and other big losses and small losses. One of the premises people I think don't understand about grief is, first of all, grief is a no judgment zone. And the problem is when we judge, judgment demands punishment. We will punish ourselves or we will punish someone else. And grief, it doesn't work to compare grief because if you win the comparison, you'll lose. So here's what I mean by that in the context of COVID. And we'll take some questions in a little while. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. So when we talk about this world we're all in, it's easy for us to judge each other's losses. And not only are we having these losses, but if you've had a death, there's not people showing up with casseroles. You may not be able to have a funeral. It's such a strange world and strange time we're in. But when we talk about these losses, it's easy to negate and dismiss and minimize some of the losses. And that usually makes us unhappier because we're judging them. So for example, it would be easy for me to say to a friend who's so sad and crying, because she's had to postpone her wedding. I could easily say to her, postpone a wedding, you're gonna to get to have one, and you're gonna to get to have it in a year. What's the big deal? So you'll get married a year later. You know, people are dying from COVID, my son died. That would be the comparison world. First of all, when people ask me, what's the worst grief? I always say yours. The one you're dealing with is the worst grief. So for example, in that situation, 
when we talk about this idea of the worst grief. You know, for that woman who's been planning on her wedding since she was five, that may be her worst grief. That probably is her worst, worst grief. And I believe the world is big enough to contain all our griefs. Her grief doesn't take away from my son dying. Someone losing their job doesn't take away from a loss I've had. All these losses get to ex exist in the world together. And people find that the more you acknowledge one another's grief, the more we sort of have appreciation for the struggle. Many of you have heard the quote that um, everyone you know is going through a struggle you have not, you know, you have no clue about. So we're all dealing with struggles at this time. And how do we get through this? How do we manage this? And part of what's happening is that one of the interesting concepts that many people have experienced is a concept that people don't ever think of outside the world of death and dying. And that's anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief is the grief that happens before the death. It happens before the death. A loved one gets a diagnosis and we go into anticipatory grief. That's a terminal diagnosis. Or we deal with healthy anticipatory grief when we um, um, think about our parents. We know that someday our parents are going to get old and we're going to have to deal with that dreadful day that we have to say goodbye. That's healthy anticipatory grief. Unhealthy anticipatory grief that so many people have been experiences, experienced during COVID is they're watching so much news. They're hearing about this virus that's invisible. It's everywhere. And all of a sudden they find themselves catastrophizing. They're just picturing these movies in their mind of people they know dying from this virus and maybe them getting sick themselves. And those movies in our mind cause something inside of us called anxiety. And so we get anxiety when we watch these horrific movies about a future that hasn't even happened. So one of the tips I always tell people when they're dealing with this kind of loss in their mind is to picture themselves at a modern day cineplex that we can't go in, a movie cineplex. You're watching the worst movie in your mind happen over and over again. I'm like, leave that movie and go into one of the other movies. Leave the worst possible scenario and go to the movie called The Best Possible Scenario. The best possible scenario is someone you love doesn't die. You wear a mask, you stay healthy. You stay six feet away from folks. The reality is life will probably happen somewhere in between. But I would like people to try that, to not stay in that challenging, challenging anxiety that so many of us live in when we picture the worst that can happen. And we do that in grief a lot. You know, when you've had a catastrophe, it's easy to catastrophize. I always joke about, I never have a headache. I only get a brain tumor. Because I've seen so much, that's where my mind goes. So when you experience the loss, you often deal with all those kind of issues. When we talk these days about COVID, by the way, if anyone out there has had a death from COVID and you need some support in this disconnected world where many grief groups are closed, I started an online free group that for anyone who's had a death from COVID, as well as anyone who's had a death because you maybe couldn't see your loved one, you couldn't have a funeral. So if you need extra support and you want to check out that free group, please go to grief.com is where you can find that information and get any information about me. In a minute, I'm going to check and see if there's any questions because I know that uh, I can just talk on and on and I want to make sure that those of you watching that we have a chance to interact and a chance to help you with anything you may be struggling with because I know that grief is not something we often talk about. 
And yet this world is a world that we're talking about it. Many of you uh, saw, I did, I've, I've written so much over the years. And in COVID, I did one article for Harvard Business Review about the discomfort you're feeling is grief. And it went viral because the reality is we're suddenly in this world where we're going, I don't know why I'm so sad. I don't know what's wrong that I just feel so heavy. And I wanted people to know you're not crazy. That heaviness is grief. That heaviness, that sadness you're feeling is grief. And how do we help one another? And you know, we can't get together, but I always say we can at least virtually hold one another's hands. And that's so important to do during this time. People are suffering, you know, grief in a normal world is isolating. And now we're in this world that's isolating in itself. And as it's isolating, we're even more isolated. And the antidote to isolation and loneliness is connection. So these days, whenever you can take a walk with someone, whenever you can FaceTime or Zoom with someone, any kind of connection is better than no connection because it can be so much of a struggle to sort of deal with all these kind of losses. And many people around us just don't understand what the struggle of grief feels like. And it's a lonely road. What grief does is grief takes us from this road that we thought we were going to live on with our loved one, this was the road. Grief rips you off of that road and onto this road, a road we never prepared for without our loved one. So we have to grieve our loved one who died, but also the future we're not gonna have anymore with them and the future they're not gonna have. All those losses happen together. When I was researching Finding Meaning, one of the surprising things, I never thought I'd be writing about this, is I looked and did a little research on buffaloes. Here, yeah, I know, I never thought buffaloes research grief, but buffaloes, when there is a storm, actually run into the storm. And by running into the storm, they actually minimize time. They're in the discomfort of the storm. Think about that. One, it's kind of brilliant. Two, we run from grief and it stays a mile behind us for years, always impacting us. Just a misery of grief. You know, grief is in our heart, it's in our mind, and it's in our body. Our bodies remember. Um, I work with Paul Denniston. I actually do retreats with him in that physical world that's not happening right now. But Paul does grief yoga. And when I first heard that, I went Greek yogurt, but it's actually grief yoga. Uh, and he talks about how grief gets stuck in our body. And I always think about how our emotions need motion, whether we need to walk or do something like grief yoga. And grief yoga isn't about physical um, uh, being able to move. It's not, you know, that kind of yoga. I'm not a yogi. Uh, it's more about emotional liberation and you can do grief yoga from a chair. So check that out if you uh, uh, ever feel like you're dealing with grief in your body because it is there. So it's so important that we look at all these losses that compound over the years, how we neglect losses. The other thing I want to mention about that is one of the negative byproducts of the self-help world is this. So much good has come from the self-help world. But one of the challenging things is we're the first generation that has feelings upon feelings. So what that means is this. We feel sad, but we don't think we have a right to feel sad because there's kids who have died. Or we feel angry, but anger is inappropriate. And it's so appropriate, it's actually a stage of grief, a stage of dying too. But we judge these feelings and we suppress them and we end up having half felt feelings, our life, instead of just expressing them. 
and to let the anger out in a safe way. I always say anger is pain's bodyguard. Anger is pain's bodyguard. So in a moment, I'm going to just start taking questions, but I really want to say this. I have a confession. Shame needs secrecy to survive. It's important we tell our secrets. And it's important to me that I make amends for things that I've done. So let me share a little secret that I'm not very proud of. Years ago, I would walk into just a sweet bookstore near my house, and I would go in and browse through the books, and I loved seeing them laid out, and I loved flipping through the pages. And when I saw what I liked, I could go in the bookstore and I could read a little bit of it when I can touch it and feel it. And when I saw that and did that, I would take a picture of the book with my phone and I would go online and I would order it. And then you know what happened? One day my bookstore wasn't there anymore. And that's on me. There's no being in denial around that. So I'm a big believer now. If you at all think you're ever going to get one of my books or for a gift for a friend or for yourself, this is put on by Copperfield's Books. It's so important. We support independent bookstores. Please get this book from them because they're bringing this to you. They're helping me share this information with you. And I want to honor them. And they're giving you 10% off, correct, Jamie? She's going to unmute for that. Correct. <laughs> so I'm, I'm releasing my shame here and now in telling people, don't do as I, because you know what? If that happens, we can't ever say, you know, there used to be a really cute bookstore. I wonder whatever happened to it. No, no, no. We're responsible for what happens in our world. So we need to support our bookstores. Okay? That was so lovely. Oh my goodness, David. I appreciate the shout out to indie bookstores. Absolutely. And you're speaking to my heart right there. And also that was just really unbelievable to hear you talk. And we have some really fantastic questions. So I don't want to blap on about how much I enjoyed it. Um, our first question is uh, from Judy, and she's wondering if you would speak more about meaning. Her husband died five years ago. I'm 80. I have wonderful children, grandchildren, and friends. I have a good social network and interests, but I'm unable to find meaning. I feel like my life is over, especially now with COVID. Well-meaning people suggest volunteering, various hobbies, etc but it all seems so trite and superficial. How do I proceed to find meeting? It's a great question. So um, did she say how long ago her husband died? Five years ago. Five years ago. So it's really hard to recognize the meaning that's there, but it is there. Let me tell you what I bet some meaning is. You say you have kids, maybe even grandkids I might've heard. So when you tell them about their dad or tell a story about your husband, you're bringing meaning to his life. You're actually bringing meaning to his life by telling us about it. I'm also not gonna sugarcoat it. COVID's hard. It's not that easy to go volunteer. It's not that easy to do a lot of things these days and you know, that might not feel right for you. But if you can think about how did your husband enrich your life? What part of him lives on in you? I'm not asking you to not be sad or not miss him or not live in a huge void with him gone. But in addition to that pain, meaning is there. And our job is to recognize it. And recognizing it makes a difference. That makes a huge difference. I bet you, if you asked some of your family members, do I bring meaning to your life? Your family members would tell you, you bring meaning 
to their life. So my guess is meaning is all around you. We just have to learn to recognize it. And the book helps us do that. Thank you for that great question. Thanks for that. Our next question is one that I'm sure everyone on this call can relate to. Um, Virginia is wondering, with the upcoming election, can we expect to experience a type of grief if our candidate doesn't win? So here's the interesting thing like for anticipatory. me. <laughs> here's my interesting take that people don't expect is people have said to me, is the grief that we feel when Trump was elected, is that real grief? And I'll go, yes, it's real grief. And I can actually tell you as someone who's worked in this field for years, Every presidential election, I have seen someone in grief because there's always a good part of our country that didn't get what they were hoping for. And when you don't get what I saw with Obama, I saw it with Trump, when you don't get what you're hoping for, that disappointment is a form of grief. So I hope we're not more in grief, whatever our political uh, way may be. Um, and it is sad what's happening in the world these days. It is sad. I, I can't, you know, there's a lot of sadness. And it's interesting. One of the things I talk about with COVID is those numbers right now, people are going to watch this in the replay. Who knows what the numbers are going to be down the road when people watch this. But right now, they're a little over 200,000. It's hard for us to imagine that. I tell people, imagine 1,500 planes crashing, like a 737. We all know the size of Southwest Airline planes. I love Southwest, but just was on one. But that would be like a Southwest plane crashing eight times a day. So we have to realize what's going on in this world. And because there's not funerals, we're not witnessing the grief. The other thing that's interesting is because um, of George Floyd, there's been so much racial injustice that has been unwitnessed. And with George Floyd, we finally had a video to see what's going on. And, uh, you know, it's been a challenging world for all of us to live in. All of that on top of, you know, 2020. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenging year. I don't have to tell anyone that. Definitely not. <laughs> um, our next question is um, from Renee, and she's wondering if you can speak to how a grief support group for loss of a parent is often more helpful than trying to connect with your own family members. We have the illusion that our family members and friends are going to get our grief. And people in grief are so shocked that the people closest to us often don't understand or estimate our grief. And for decades, people in grief have been gathering with one another because People in grief seem to be the only people who understand people in grief in that moment. So grief support groups are so, so important. Uh, I know you've put grief.com up there. There's online groups there that people can find that's so important during this challenging time. So I'm a big believer in grief support. It's great. And I did share the, the grief.com, everyone in your chat box, it's there. Um, okay. Jason is wondering, how important is it to have a counselor who has experienced the same type of trauma that the patient has suffered? I don't think it's necessary. For example, I work with people all the time that have had losses I have never had. I mean, I work, you know, yeah, there's just a million losses. So I understand the concept of grief. I clearly understand the concept of pain. Here's what I would tell you about counselors that I think is important. My 
most 90% of my time is training counselors. Counselors do not get a lot of training in grief and loss. So I think it is important that you have a counselor who's had some training. And it's easy to feel like, oh, well, grief and loss is one of those things in life. I don't really need training, but you really do. So I would say make sure grief.com also has a listing of counselors that are interested in this field. So uh, um, I would say that to me is the most important factor is to find someone who's uh, and had losses of their own. Doesn't have to be your exact and by the way, I think he mentioned uh, trauma. It's interesting to think about this. All grief does not have trauma, but all trauma has grief. It's a very interesting thing to point out. Um, thanks for that answer. We have a couple more questions. Again, we'll have time for a few more if, if you want to kind of get another one in there, submit some feedback. Um, I love the questions. They're great. Yeah. Um, Susan is wondering if there is a difference between grief and mourning. Grief and mourning. Yes. Grief is what we feel on the inside. Mourning is what we do on the outside. Hmm. So I can't ever see someone's grief. I can't go, uh, she's crying more than her sister. She's more in grief. That's just what they're doing outwardly we all experience grief differently. So we can't see grief. We can only see acts of mourning. So that's why you can't really judge anyone's grief because you can't see it. Oh, grief is such a tough one. <laughs> grief is a tough one. And I want to just tell you this, anyone who's done anything amazing, who you admire has been through challenge and grief. And I'll tell you, it's interesting that, you know, this is a world that has a lot of grief, but somehow we got a little lost thinking that life would be full of um, uh, peaks and that maybe we'd be the only generation, you know, every generation has had something, whether it's been the Vietnam War or World War II or the AIDS epidemic or something. And it was almost like, oh, well, we're gonna get through it with nothing. And apparently, once again, that didn't turn out to be true, that every generation does get something. 9-11, so many things have happened. All right, gosh, just think of 2020. Oh, wow. I uh, saw just like on a, you know, how you see um, uh, memes and graphics. Uh -huh. Someone, they wrote something like, I'm binge watching this show called Earth. And boy, in 2020, things really get crazy. And I thought, yep. <laughs> oh goodness um so jenna is wondering and i know you spoke a little bit about online tools but you know are there any online tools for grief yoga or moving emotions absolutely if you go to paul deniston's site it's griefyoga.com griefyoga.com uh he's got like you know a lot of free resources that people can use there I have a lot of free resources at mine, as well as I have that online group for people who need more intensive work. There's a, um, um, a, uh, um, a really robust uh, online community that I have that's paid if people want that kind of resource. I found, you know, when my son died, I went to Compassionate Friends, which is free and wonderful for people who have had a child die. I went to grief counseling and I still needed more. So, and I'm a grief expert. So I, I tell people, you know, when your air condition breaks, you don't hesitate to call the repair man. When your TV breaks, you don't hesitate to, well now, that's not a good example. We just, <laughs> but we get support when things aren't working and you deserve support when you're having a tough time you deserve support. So get support for yourself, however that looks. Those are great resources. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, a follow-up from Jenna is, can you speak about how to work on healing when there are both grief and trauma wrapped up together, like witnessing the traumatic death of a loved one? Oof. Sure. So one, 
we often get those images, those intrusive images. One of the things that I help people work with, and obviously we don't have time to go deeply into it, but there's a couple of things just to sort out in your mind. One, there is the grief and there is the trauma. But I try to help people understand there's a third thing called the traumatic moment. And it sounds like your traumatic moment or moments was watching your loved one die, however they died, and I'm sure it was just horrible. But to understand your loved one is not in that traumatic moment anymore, and nor are you. The traumatic moment has ended. And many people stay in that traumatic moment and have what we call post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. I help them get out of that moment so that then we can work on the grief and work on the trauma. But you first have to realize that traumatic moment is over. And by the way, this book is really about post-traumatic growth. We don't talk about post-traumatic growth, but it happens more than post-traumatic stress. Oh. So it's important that people understand you can grow from something too. And one of the concepts I tell people is we often think our work is to make the grief smaller. The grief doesn't get smaller. We have to grow bigger. We have to grow around the grief. We have to get bigger. Oh, that's great. Great feedback and suggestions. Um, okay, I think we'll have time for maybe a couple more here. Um, this is interesting. Peter's wondering, um, reconciliation with others who knew the deceased, is that an opportunity for meaning? Reconciliation with others. So if you were to reconcile with them or just be with them and talk about and share memories, that can absolutely be meaning. But I also want people to know, you don't need another person for meaning. The meaning is in you. You don't need anyone to agree on it with you. You don't need anyone to share it with you. It's really about you. So to find that meaning that's in you, and like I said, it doesn't erase the pain. We work on the pain together, but it helps us cushion that pain. And then we come together with others and hopefully have a richer life together. Oh, all right. Um, one last one here. And I'm sorry, my little devil cat is in the background. I hope you aren't all hearing that. That's life. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> online these days. He just wants to be out so I'm bad. in a hotel room with like a chandelier <laughs> looking like it's a crown over me. <laughs> Appropriate. <laughs> Um, okay, let's go with one last question here. It does. It's so funny. I just realized that I look like I have a little thing here. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> a big <laughs> crown. Just sitting here in a hotel room with a light over me. <laughs> Fancy. I actually don't live in a place that has gold curtains and gold lighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're back. I guess you're in the South. Wow. Um, okay. I'm trying to decide the one that's most okay. Um, Susan is wondering, any thoughts for people who are grieving the same loss, but doing it in such different ways there is tension? Yes, there is tension because we're judging each other's grief. What you think of my grief is none of my business. And how other people grieve is also none of my business. My only business is my grief. Whether the person next to me is crying more or less, not my business. Whether they're angry or not angry, not my business. This is the only grief I can attend to. The problem is once I start looking at how we're grieving different and you're doing this, why aren't you doing that? When I go onto your side of the tennis court, I have abandoned my own grief. So let go of what's going on with their grief and be with yours and attend to yours. 
It's been so wonderful to have you here with us. I'm receiving, you know, so many thank yous in the comments here. And, um, you know, before we end, I was, you know, do you have any last minute thoughts or comments that you want to share with us? As much as we run from grief, those who grieve well, live well. And meaning is such an amazing way to honor those who have died. You know, we all come from a long line of dead people. Every ancestor we've ever had has died. And how can we live a life that makes our loved ones proud, that honors them? That's what I hope Finding Meaning the Sixth Stage will do. That's so great. And, and thank you so much for everything you do. I have so much admiration for the peace of mind and the solace that you bring to those grieving everywhere. It's... Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I mean, we, you know, oh, yes. I wish I was there in person and I look forward, like, can we do this live someday? I would love that. Your next book, you're coming to Copperfield. <laughs> really? Do I have to write another book? <laughs> oh, no, the next edition. How about that? <laughs> all right, deal. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank and you. thank you to all of you who attended. I will be sending around an email with, um, links to watch this event and um, links to purchase the book and also the 10% discount code, as well as additional works that David has done. So you'll have the opportunity to get all of that. Oh, and I will share the websites that were given during this. And please support your local bookstore. Yes. Don't do what I did. Keep them alive and healthy. Yes, and last minute, I just wanted to let everyone know groundbreaking for Copperfields is all of our virtual events are now going to be available on YouTube. So you never have to miss another event. You can rewatch your favorite authors. Um, we're very excited about it. So stay tuned for more on that. But David, thank you so much. Oh, and Such Jamie, this and everyone that's been on, it's been meaningful to me. So thank you. Great, and you know, take care. Thanks.